You're listening to Three Kitchens Podcast, a member of the Alberta Podcast Network. Locally grown, community supported. Now let's get cooking, because I'm starving. With Pod Power, our sponsors are making it possible for us to amplify the voices of Albertans and Alberta podcasters. This episode, Edmonton Community Foundation is helping us give a Pod Power shout out to Overdue Finds, an Edmonton Public Library podcast. Bryce Cretenden and Caroline Land host conversations about books, movies, music, pop culture, and other interesting news about Edmonton. It's a great way to learn more about what's happening at EPL and how you can use your library card to access all of EPL's in-person and online services. To listen and find out more about Overdue Finds, head to epl.ca slash podcast. Welcome to another episode of Three Kitchens. I'm Heather Dyer. I'm here with Aaron Walker and Sarah Somasundaram, my guests, not my guests, my (laughs) co-hosts. Hi, ladies. Hi. Hello. Good morning. And we are really excited today because we are talking about making cheese, which is something we've together kind of been talking about, we've been curious about for a little while. And we have a guest with us today who knows all about making cheese. Her name is Alexis Cobham, a self-proclaimed curd nerd, which I loved when I read on your website, (laughs) um, who started the business Cheesemaker along with her husband and business partner, Jeremy Bossio. And Cheesemaker is making it possible for anybody to make cheese at home, which is just, it's really cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us, Alexis. Could you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and Cheesemaker? Absolutely. Yeah, so I'm uh, born in Victoria, British Columbia. One fun fact, I'm I'm actually one of seven children. My parents were very adventurous and we would spend our summers traveling around the Gulf Islands. So that was a really fun. Wow. wow. Yeah, That's it was a really amazing. neat way to. Wow. Um, but yeah, so I uh, did school here and then actually moved to Vancouver. I did my degree at uh, SFU and then I remained in Vancouver. That's where I went to culinary school and uh, oh. where I developed my first business, which was a catering company. And that's where I was uh, part of a business program as well and did a year of business development to learn about what it looks like to become an entrepreneur. And my husband and I decided to uh, move back to the island. Uh, yeah, so I we just moved back just uh, in the beginning of COVID around uh, early 2020. So we're just kind of settling uh, back into a new community here. Uh, yeah, Cheesemaker was uh, sort of created and uh, fostered and, and grew uh, all, all of throughout the years that I was in Vancouver. So so you said you went to SFU. What was your degree in? Yeah, I, I studied English. Okay. <laughs> I did a Bachelor of Arts in English. <laughs> I, I didn't actually know at the time what I was uh, doing. <laughs> Just a young, mm-hmm. young 20-year-old. I think that's old. all of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. But yeah, I just thought it was something that kind of made sense. And it was just really the experience of being in university. And looking back at in some ways, I thought it would be really, it would have been neat if I had done maybe some business programs that mm-hmm. you can take. And mm-hmm. um, that's actually something we incorporate a lot in our business. We make sure that we are always hiring a young business students to give them opportunities to work in small businesses. And it's a really oh, neat, cool. it's a bit of a mentorship program that we do, as well as part of it is government funded. So it's actually really helpful for us because then we can get these small projects that they can work on and then it, it advances their company. Which is- and that's a great opportunity for the students as well. It is. Yeah, they learn a lot. I'm very education focused and to know that they come from after three to four years of being in, in business school, the practicalities of running a mm-hmm. business are mm-hmm. very much still something that I think they would probably need to incorporate in the curriculum mm. of the business programs because I think that as much as it as wonderful it is to learn about how a business is run in theory the in-person practical applications um, since we essentially have become an online business in the last right right years. and so to learn about e-commerce is pretty much the way to go um, in the future and we've had a lot of education because uh, cheesemaker was not um, an online business whatsoever it was very much in person mm-hmm. and 
so that's been a transition that we have made. Um, so they essentially walk away with a very high level of integrated practical experience about um, all aspects of a business. So it, it actually feels really nice that they can get that that great experience, even just for four or eight months with us. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. fantastic. And it keeps you engaged in the learning community, I'm sure, and always picking up new things and learning new stuff and bringing in fresh minds, right? That's super helpful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially when it comes to social media. <laughs> <laughs> I must say that is not that is not my forte and not necessarily my desire. Right. So we've got uh, we have three students actually right now and um, for a summer program and we've got them all on TikTok. We've got, <laughs> oh, <fun. laughs> we've got them making videos every week to build up a TikTok account and um, just to find out if that's going to help. Right. So was it was it in um, culinary school that you first made cheese or was this something that your family did when you were growing up? That's a great question. Um, no and no. Oh. <laughs> um, so it's actually Ooh. something I learned um, uh, very much self-driven on my own. However, I did it while I was in culinary school. So after okay. I graduated from SFU, I had a very good friend at the time who actually was living in Calgary and it, she was about to buy a farm with her fiance and um, she was delving into yogurt making and uh, she was making butter and started learning a little bit very slowly this process of cheese making. And so I went on a break, I went to visit her and I was sort of watching her in this very organic, very artisanal world of making all of these things was from scratch but with dairy because she was she was really interested in, in starting an organic dairy farm and so I just sort of kind of got this little basic learning from her and I was thinking why why are we learning this in culinary school as well mm -hmm. right I came back and I just started thinking about yogurt making and butter making and and we had talked about cheese making so I actually self-educated for the first little while um, YouTube was one of my main sources of uh, learning. And I just started uh, watching videos and exploring sort of the early, early stages. Um, I purchased a few cheese making books. Kind of my, my Bible was uh, Mary Carlin's Artisan Cheese Making Book, which is a very, very excellent source for a beginner cheese maker. Mm -hmm. And then I just thought, I'm going to do some cheese making sessions. And I'm, right. I think that's a really neat way to learn is about how to teach others. Mm -hmm. And so I started uh, teaching cheese making classes, very small, just to whoever was interested. I've been to Italy and I have done cheese making in Italy. It's such a, a cultural experience, the different local cheeses, um, the fresh cheeses uh, that you can make. And I mean, it's it's a lifelong learning. I, I definitely don't, I am not an expert. There really is no such thing as, as like a school of cheese making that right. I'm aware of. Mm, right. Mm -hmm. I think it would be so neat to be able to go to school for cheese making and to somehow get some form of formal uh, education. Or right. I got the opportunity to go back to the culinary school that I went to in Vancouver. It was the Northwest Academy of Van uh, Culinary School of Vancouver. And I got to go back as a uh, educator and teach everyone there how to make cheese, including ah. the instructors. Oh, fun. <laughs> they recorded me and now it's a part of their curriculum. Are there schools for cheese making in other countries? Um, I haven't done a lot of research. I think that there are programs that you could probably do. Right. Mm. Often the education comes from owners at cheese shops that make cheese and so you could kind of do your own internship or entrepreneurship over there with that cheese shop and that's mm -hmm. how you would learn that process but a lot of cheeses are imported from across the world so for people that specialize in certain types of cheese making mostly hard cheeses aged cheeses multi cheeses because those are things that just take so much time so for a small cheese shop to really uh, take the time and build the infrastructure for that it's it's sort of not that conducive to an actual business model so so you started hosting these classes sort of small how did cheese kits come into this and and when did you bring your partner on board <laughs> yeah <good question. laughs> that was definitely not planned <laughs> 
the cheese making classes were going really well and there was such an interest from uh, people being on the side and it was actually one of the uh, stu- or participants in the class that said um, I want to keep doing this at home and I was like oh yeah no problem and I was like I'll just give you some ingredients and you can take that with you it actually was her that had informed me I hmm. think you can make I think there's a cheese making kit in England or something that I heard right. about can do and I thought and I thought wow that's such a fascinating idea and I think at the time I was teaching maybe two to three cheeses just very simple cheeses I kind of packaged this little thing together and I you know I added the the ingredients they needed and I threw in a thermometer and cheesecloth and just something really really simple Mm -hmm. and I just thought well maybe I could build these and sell them at farmers markets just locally just again it's like some little initiative on the side so I just testing it out to be honest to see what how people would respond and I I started just selling this one kit at farmer's markets and I had a lot of people walk by very confused and said, what is that? I have, I don't, I would, why would I make cheese? You know, I just <laughs> buy it at home <laughs> or buy it at the store. And, um, and I was like, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But then I would have these people walk by with the shock and awe and delight on their face saying, I've always wanted to make my own cheese. I can't believe that I can buy it in a kid and do it. And so this was my introduction to learning a little bit about how I could maybe build this business and grow it. And just to learn a little bit about people's histories and experiences and what they're looking for. And to be mm-hmm. quite honest, it was just this building of this trend over the last decade um, that became more and more popular. It has been a a complete shift. Uh, It's the opposite now. Um, mm. People walk by and no longer do I see their shock on their, maybe, maybe the occasional person, but most people go, oh yeah, I've heard of that. I'd love to do that. The DIY culture right. is something that has just mm-hmm. absolutely flourished. It was this very natural, slow progression. I started building more kits. And so I started mm. the Matsun Ricotta first, the, the Feta second poutine, because I had just had someone from Quebec and, uh, and then Cheddar, which was an interesting that one was a little bit more challenging. It took a little bit longer to test the recipe, build the kit, think a lot about what goes in it. And then eventually the vegan kit, which is a funny one to add to our repertoire because most vegan eaters would not go to a cheese making website to purchase our kit. However, um, in my experience of meeting with people in person, I constantly heard, I would love to buy your kit, but I just don't eat dairy and I can't, I can't do dairy. And mm. so it just got me thinking, I mean, it actually, I'm embarrassed to say, I think it took me about five years to, to learn vegan cheese making because for, I was a little bit snobby at first. <laughs> <laughs> That's not real cheese. That's not real cheese. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. What my husband loves to say is um, nut juice. He doesn't oh. call. Uh, fair but, enough. Yeah. <laughs> I taught myself how to make vegan cheese and I, I added it and I had no idea how it was going to respond. And it's actually become our second best selling kit. Oh, wow. wow. The business grew and then eventually we just made it all in line, of course, when COVID hit. And then to answer your second, the second part of your question is how did my husband join? Well, I met Jeremy in uh, 2016 and it was just a part of my life. I was actually <laughs> running uh, three different businesses at the time. And Jeremy was in the food and beverage industry and he was working at Hotel Georgia. He's Italian, as you would probably notice when his name is Basio. So he has actually in a lot of in a lot of ways a lot more food experience <laughs> than I do. And he's also a very good chef. And his dad was a very good is a very good chef. And so he learned a lot about uh cooking from his his family he really is the one that learned it all from there and then you guys met and it made sense <laughs> it did in so many ways because he's such a, a big personality and is not at all afraid to sell at a booth and learn about mm. something new and so um I was so overwhelmed during the Christmas season and I was like do you want to sell some cheese kits at a craft fair because I have you know um sort of double book myself like of course why not so he jumped in and sure enough and he he put on his little Santa hat and (laughs) wasn't at all afraid about embarrassing himself (laughs) and and it was just like this natural fit and then eventually we made the big decision the big shift to leave our full-time positions and start this as a company together full-time and that was done in about 2018. So you guys are located in Victoria now. Mm -hmm. How, how far do you send your kits? (laughs) Great question. (laughs) The majority is Canada within Canada and quite a lot in the U S. So we, 
now a full-time fulfillment center based in uh, Chicago, Illinois, and they fulfill okay. all of the uh, orders that we get in the U.S. Um, we did our first in-person show in the U.S. Um, this past spring, so we were in Chicago for a week selling, <laughs> and that was a really fun experience to, again, be in person meeting um, mm -hmm. people. China is actually the fastest growing uh, country in uh, dairy consumption um, currently. So that is also a thought there as well. Teaching people how to make cheese at home based on the milk that they have access to. Mm, yeah, uh, I'm right. sure as all of you learned, milk is a very important aspect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, we That's did. That's right. <laughs> Maybe on that note, we should talk a little bit about our experience with the kids. Mm -hmm. I, I'm fascinated to hear. I love, <laughs> I love hearing about other people's experiences. I love to hear your feedback. So we were really excited to receive our cheese kits from you and they were packaged so beautifully, very cute. And then all the stuff that came with it was quite amazing too. And all we had to do was go out and find something called non homogenized milk, which was really easy to find mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. end. We just didn't really understand what that was. Very common. In Calgary, we, we found it at Community Natural Foods, which was, mm -hmm. and they even explained it to us the way you explained it in the, in the kit, in the brochure. Mm -hmm. I did mozzarella and my heart sank a little bit when you said this was the easiest one. And it was really <laughs> easy. <laughs> until it came to the shaping part everything fell into place mm -hmm. it set beautifully it was like I'm like I'm doing this until I had to heat up those cheese curds to a texture where I could stretch it and shape it I'm not sure I did a great job with it However, I got to say, it was extremely tasty. My mm. husband wouldn't stop eating it. And I kept thinking, <laughs> listen, this is for three kitchens. Like, you just have to go away. <laughs> Leave some of it. <laughs> yeah. And I loved that you recommended that we salt it. Because that's my biggest complaint when I get mozzarella from the mm. store is it's so bland. I love mozzarella, but it's so bland. And I love the fact that there was salt in it. Mm -hmm. I would love to make this again. Each of these kits can make multiple number of batches yeah. of cheese, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, that I think is my, my favorite thing and the coolest thing, because as daunting as it seemed when we first started and it was like, oh man, like I'm making cheese at home. This seems like yikes. But mm -hmm. as soon as I finished, I was like, yes, I can do this again yeah, and again. Mm -hmm. And I want to try more. Like, I love that it gives you the opportunity to really hone a skill like it's mm -hmm. not just a kit it's like a an opportunity to learn and have like a hobby right mm -hmm. it's an, like it's, it's an art form it's an art yes. yeah and you're mm -hmm. not gonna get it it's not gonna be perfect the very first time you try it right no, which is and I remember saying I said to Aaron look at this you can make like 10 batches how is this economical I don't know how Alexis <laughs> is making any money <laughs> oh. I mean it's great for the consumer but I was like wow that's crazy <laughs> It's a constant, it's a constant uh, discussion piece <laughs> with us. Um. Right, totally. I, I would love a little tip on the shape, like what texture do I have to get the mozzarella to? What am I looking for? Can you compare it to something that then the shaping becomes easier and not so lumpy in my d delicious but lumpy mm -hmm. in my case good for you for doing your best and attempting the the stretching um is is definitely by far the more uh, difficult aspect of it it's a balance of um heating it um hot enough so that it's actually melted so that when you do start to do that stretching um which is a very very slow process it's not a fast thing you don't you have to oh, really okay. hold you kind of almost need to do a combination of holding the heat inside the, the curd as it's melted and to do a very slow stretch and as you do that and then you fold it and then shape it into it the ball cool. it's a it's a difficult thing to try to teach just with a little booklet <laughs> yeah I'm sure I must have labored over the instructions yeah <laughs> how do we say this yeah I think I have had 10 different versions of those yeah. 
Oh man. That was great. I'm definitely trying it again. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Heather, did you want to? Oh, sure. I made the chevre, the goat cheese, and now I have a lot of goat cheese because yeah. I got sick and I can't share it with my friends. It's all on me, but I got a lot of goat cheese to eat. I found that it was quite when I first looked at the instructions, I thought, wow, this seems like a lot of steps. But once mm. you get into it and you start like step by step, Erin had done hers first and she told us, she's like, just go step by step. Don't, Don't be read ahead. Don't look yeah. ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was great advice because if you just go step by step, it actually is quite clear. Of course, all I, my frame of reference is what I would buy in the store, right? Like mm -hmm. what, yes. what goat cheese have I purchased in the store? And I would say mine is a little softer, like... Mm -hmm it doesn't hold the form quite as well that like I tried to make like the logs mm -hmm. um, so perhaps I could have drained it longer mm -hmm. but I mean that said it's delicious and I did salt it as well and I debated about putting other flavors <laughs> in there and I want to make it again so that I can do that I just the first time I thought I'm just going to make it plain and I'm going to see how it goes and I was really happy with it I thought that's too bad you guys <laughs> don't want yeah. my my COVID cheese <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but next time we'll share and, yeah. and, um, I think you'll really like it. I felt relatively, it was relatively easy to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. You will all have so like a world of experience going into your next batch and you'll now start to notice the subtleties and the differences. Yeah. So they gave me the cheddar cheese <laughs> because I, I once tried to make a cheese at home using a buttermilk to make. Oh, Kavork. pork. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I, I attempted that before. So because I was considered cheese experienced <laughs> by my one ex they were like, this one says it's intermediate. Guess what you're getting? Yeah. Um, it was really good up until I didn't go far enough into the instructions for the cheese press that was involved uh, yes. with this one. And so I will now be constructing a cheese press for myself because mm. my makeshift one wasn't great. And I think mm. contributed to my cheese not drying out as much because I kind of had it, it was quite a heavy weight that we had to put on top, which is because yes. I had some weights <laughs> around my yes. house. So I used like 50 pound weights on top to, to mm -hmm. press it at the end there. And because it was wiggling and moving a bit, it was mm. also in a bin. And so I don't think there was as much airflow as oh, okay. would have been optimal to kind mm. of get my cheese to dry. Sure, moisture was pressing out, but then it was kind of sitting in this nice oh, little I bucket. See. Oh, okay. <laughs> mm. Just so that it didn't tilt and shift and move. So right, right. I now have a plan. I'm getting cutting boards when I go grocery shopping next, and I'm just going to use them to make my cheese press because mm -hmm. you've got a good picture. And uh, my husband and I are like, oh, yeah, we can build that. Mm -hmm. So... I can't wait to like get on the boat again and try this again and do more with it. I think that was our favorite of the three cheeses. Yeah, it was really, I really tasty. enjoyed that, was that one. The cheddar. Mm -hmm. And my yeah. first statement was like, why aren't they selling cheddar cheese like this at the store? <laughs> <laughs> this is I want to eat. It was delicious. Mm -hmm. I'm the type of person that I want to try and do it better next time. I want to mm -hmm. learn more next time. She and really I'm, is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And she will. <laughs> and which is exactly why we give you enough ingredients to uh, make multiple batches because yeah. we are very aware that most people doing it for the first time um, will not uh, achieve the uh, perfect end results. It's, uh, it's just like anything. It's a learning curve. And mm -hmm. like, it's still a really tasty product. Really tasty. Mm -hmm. like exactly. You can't go wrong with the flavor that you get out of it. We say no matter what, you always get some form of cheese, even if it's not perfect. As we mentioned earlier, Alexis has generously provided the vegan cheese kit for us to give away. So we invite our listeners to head over to Three Kitchens podcast on Instagram to enter our draw. And thank you again, Alexis. Alexis for yes, bringing that you. for us for our Pleasure. for our nut juice. <laughs> <laughs> well, as someone who I mean, obviously I eat dairy. I'm talking about it here, but I definitely am a bit sensitive to it. And so I, it's kind of in moderation and carefully. I don't really have an experience with vegan cheese. And I did consider, I was like, oh, should I, should I get the vegan kit? Cause I kind of I'm curious about this, especially making it myself, because I just have this idea that it's going to be better, the one you make right, at home, right. mm -hmm. than the vegan cheese you might buy at the store. Mm -hmm. I could yeah. be wrong, but mm -hmm. that's my guess. Well, so far, all three kits have proven. <laughs> yeah. That, that so I, I'm yeah, going to guess it's going to be a really good one. 
Mm -hmm. yes. It's very easy to convert uh, non cheese eaters to the vegan kit. And it's not as easy to convert mentally the <laughs> thought of going from when you can have the real cheese to mm -hmm. eating something like the vegan cheese. But I actually am always very pleasantly surprised to find out that people really enjoy the vegan cheese. You can actually uh, slice and grate and melt. And um, that one is the by far other than the cheddar, which is really fun to flavor. Um, but it's the best one to flavor because then you really, it's just a very simple recipe and then you can add what you want in because it's a raw cheese. You actually don't cook it. You just blend mm. it in a blender. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. It's a very yeah. different experience than making cheese and you literally blend it all together and then you add your flavors, uh, whatever you like, pour it in the mold and set it for an hour and then it's done. So it's mm. a very, very, very simple one. So yeah. <laughs> well, listen, if nobody Nobody enters the contest. Yeah, right. We will certainly be making it. <laughs> but please do, please do, listeners, please enter. Okay, um, we want to do a quick little fun few questions. Do you have a favorite go-to meal for a busy weeknight? Gosh, it's got to be pizza. I just love pizza. It's very simple. Yeah, it's a good one. Okay, how about cake or pie? Cake, definitely. Cake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what what kind of cake? I want to know more. <laughs> I really like cho basic chocolate cake with like cream cheese icing on it. Ooh. It's kind of like a, it's like a carrot cake, but with chocolate. Oh, that mm. sounds good. We need that recipe. Yeah. yeah. What is that? I just kind of made it up. <laughs> oh, even better. Um, okay. If you could travel anywhere tomorrow and eat the local cheese, where would you go? Oh, definitely Italy. It's, I, it's, it's just, yeah. If you could only eat one type of cheese for the rest of your life, which one's it going to be? Hmm. It's a good one. That's so hard. I would, oh, I don't know. Um, I, uh, it's a tough competition between Parmesan and Manchego because I just, this just can't go wrong with an incredibly delicious Manchego sheep cheese. I, I think those are probably, I, I don't know, I might have to go with Manchego. <laughs> Well, luckily you don't actually have to make that choice. So yes, <laughs> you know, don't, don't stress about it. <laughs> so initially after we made the cheese, uh, we were going to get together and sort of made, make a charcuterie mm -hmm. board and, and then Heather didn't feel so good. Heather just doesn't want to share the goat cheese with us. I think what that the maybe it. Down to. She's yeah, like, I yeah, that may be it. sorry. You guys, sick. I have so much goat cheese. <laughs> It makes a lot. <laughs> it makes a lot. I really wanted to share. <laughs> when you have different kinds of cheese with different textures and different, you know, some are really mild, some are sharp, some are stronger tasting. How do you pair uh, wine with cheese or other foods with cheese? Is there like a couple of tips you can give us for, you know, amateurs? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. So, um, I mean, a lot of it is, is sort of your preference. I know you guys were really hoping to do the charcuterie board, which is great because that's the perfect example to use. So um, usually you want to have a variety of flavors, right? And you want to have a variety of textures. So it's nice to, I think, offer a variety um, of cheeses, maybe that are less salted that can be paired with very salty meats like prosciutto um, or anything a little bit more hearty, like um, something like a chorizo that might be really spicy. Um, right. So it's kind of a neat uh, sort of a thought process of how to do that. And then of course, charcuterie always incorporates some kind of sweet jam or um, apricots or dried fruit, which is really nice. And then it's also nice to have that little bit of a crunch. So with crackers or nuts. Um, I, I'm not a, a wine expert. Um, actually, Jeremy is the perfect person to ask that question. <laughs> I would say that, again, um, probably just about preference, but when I think of sort of wine pairings with cheese, usually um, I think like a Cab, Cab Sab or Merlot's kind of come to mind because they're maybe not really very full bodied. And mm -hmm. it depends on the experience you're having. If you're doing a wine tasting, you're trying to find something that is going to clean, cleanse your palate for the mm -hmm. wine so that right. you can... Uh, uh -huh. experience that was different but if you're actually the focus is on the, the food you don't want a wine that's overpowering or going to mess up your taste buds or take away from the the meat or the cheese e eating experience so i probably would select something that's a little bit Mild. um doesn't have a ton of flavors mm. we're going to be doing that this summer i for think sure. we'll just have oh, to yeah. try all of the above <laughs> yeah <laughs> 
Well, thank you so much for yes, joining us. You. This was really fun. And we had so much fun with the cheese. When I, I saw yeah. it like on a Facebook ad, originally it was cheesemaker.ca, uh, everybody. Your interns are doing good job. <laughs> yeah. And, and I was like, what? I've never heard of this. You guys, have you guys heard of this? And they said, no. And I'm like, I'm going to contact them because I, <laughs> this looks really fun. Yeah. So could you tell our listeners uh, where to find you on your socials, on your website? Absolutely. Yeah. Website is the best way cheesemaker.ca um, is has all of the information our email is info at cheesemaker.ca we did recently open up um, DIY cheesemaker.com sort of for our US uh, sites and we can find you on TikTok and Facebook and Instagram uh, absolutely yeah we have our Facebook account um, Instagram TikTok uh, we've got videos on YouTube. We've been delving a bit into Pinterest. We do uh, a virtual cheese making classes or virtual cheese making events for corporations as well. So we mm. use that a lot oh. in uh, LinkedIn for businesses. Yeah, everybody go check it out mm. and um, follow them and order your cheese kits because yeah. it's a lot of fun. Seriously. Delicious. Yeah, more importantly, <laughs> delicious. <laughs> yeah, and be prepared to have lots of cheese that you're going to share with your friends. It's quite incredible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's a community experience yeah, yeah yeah totally well thank you so much for having me what a really fun exciting thing it's my first podcast so it's a uh, yay a <laughs> <laughs> I hope we made it painless <laughs> yeah <it's> so easy <laughs> it was so awesome chatting with Alexis now we're going to break for a quick ad and come back and find out how we're going to take this cheese and add some stuff to it that you're definitely going to want to eat and how we're going to cut the cheese oh <laughs> <laughs> this episode of Three Kitchens is brought to you by Alberta Blue Cross. Alberta Blue Cross understands that running a small business is tough, and they understand business owners in Alberta are busy. Let Alberta Blue Cross give you peace of mind with a group benefit plan. They offer health, dental, life, and disability coverage for your employees. Alberta Blue Cross group benefit plans are easy to manage anywhere, anytime, and on any device, making it easy for you and your employees to access. To learn more and explore your options, head to ab.bluecross.ca. Welcome back. Well, sadly, we couldn't all get together and cheese it up. Cheese it up. <laughs> cheese it up. And put it all on a pretty board and then sit down and eat together, but... Heather had to go out and get sick. No, I'm <laughs> I did get to taste your cheeses, but I, mm -hmm. we could not get together in a room and and put them all on a board. <laughs> we forged forward. We still ate a lot of cheese and made some yummy stuff. So yeah, we made some yummy things to go with cheese. Exactly. Sarah made things with the cheese. Mm -hmm. Yes, Sarah made stuff with the cheese. I made things that go beside the cheese or yes. that the cheese goes on. Mm -hmm. Heather, what did you do with your cheese? I did a pickle because oh. I like cheese and pickles together. And I did an escabeche, which is a Mexican pickled vegetable. Oh. Typically, I think you can use like whatever vegetables you got. Um, I just did a red onion and carrot because that's what I had in my fridge. And the recipe that I followed also had jalapenos, but I didn't have any of those. And so I just did the onion and carrot. I just want to say that escabeche. Yeah. Escabeche. Escabeche. It's fun to say. So it has uh, coriander and cumin seeds, apple cider vinegar, water, salt, and sugar. Just a quick pickle, but it has kind of Mexican flavors with the cumin and coriander seed. Okay. Cut your veggies up small. Bring your, your vinegar, water, and spices to a boil first, and then put them on the veggies. Mm -hmm. And it says, let cool and refrigerate for at least 30 minutes. Well, mine have been in the fridge now for like a week. Yeah. Right. And they're still tasting yummy. Mm. I love the idea of a pickle with the cumin seeds in it. Mm -hmm. Ooh, and coriander. And coriander. And coriander. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, my. Okay. Now I have to make this, too. Mm hmm now, if you don't have seeds, uh, you can use the ground spices. Uh, I use the seeds mm -hmm. because I kind of like that. Oh, and toast them a little bit first. Just right. toast Ooh. them a bit in the pot and then add your other stuff to the pot and right. boil it right. and put it over. It's really quick. What takes more time is cutting your veggies small. Like mm -hmm. cut, I cut my, I kind of julienned my carrots. So that's it. And it's a delicious little uh, pickle. 
that you can serve with whatever. That sounds really good. I wish we could have eaten that, but I think um, I'm going to make that yeah. anyway because it's really easy and I have the seeds and I love me a good pickle. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. that sounds great. Okay, I didn't actually get to eat all the things Sarah made because my family liked it so much. Yes. However, I would like to hear about them because I did see them. <laughs> uh, so I, in in the first part of the recording, you know, we talked about how I shaped the mozzarella and, you know, very amateurish, <laughs> amateur hours. So it was kind of bumpy and ugly. So I thought, how do I hide this? <laughs> so what I did was I whipped up some egg in a bowl. I dipped it in the egg and then I pressed it into a mixture of panko crumbs. You can use just regular breadcrumbs and Parmesan cheese. And I pressed Ooh. it into that. And then I pan fried it. Mm. When you pan fried it, like it kind of flattened out a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I got to say, I didn't share that one with my family because by the time <laughs> they got back from their dog walk, You'd eaten it all? I had eaten it all. And you know, I'm like you, Heather, I can't eat too much cheese. And I felt that because I just kept oh. popping. It was so good. <laughs> so um, I did get one of those before my yeah. kids ran off with them. Ooh. And I had missed the little package of like a dip. I didn't know it was dip. And I had missed that and they were gone. And then you were like, I texted and you said, that's a dip for the cheese. And I'm like, oh, well, whoops, <laughs> the cheese is gone. Um, but even just like on their own. Holy. Yeah. I want deep fried, not deep fried. I want fried cheese like all the time. <laughs> so good. So I made that dip, how I make a uh, meat sauce for spaghetti, but without the meat. So okay, just cool. your normal celery, carrots, bay leaf, wine, butter, tomato sauce, easy season. So that was the dip for the fried matzo balls. And then I found these little pitas, these mm -hmm. tiny little pitas in the store. I don't know if you've seen them. They're like the size of yeah. your palm. Yeah or half of your palm, I guess. I made them into little pizzas. I took some of the sauce and I put it on there. I took some bacon. I boiled the bacon. Oh. And then I boiled it down until it started frying and I took it off the pan. Um, and it's a great way to keep your bacon flat. Mm. Oh, I saw something about Without this. Curl it oh. curling up. Yeah. And then I cut that up and I put that on the pizza and then I put a little bit of mozzarella on top of that and I broiled them. Ooh. And uh, so until they were nice and melty and crispy. And those were little pizzas, I guess, bacon pizzas. That's what bacon the kids ran pizzas. off with. I did not <laughs> sample those. They came back and said, are there more? Where's, <laughs> where's more of this? Because apparently they were really I good. put the pizzas on a plate and put them on the table and then turned around to get the matzo balls <laughs> and then add them to the plate and then when I turned around the plate was empty <laughs> and my kid had two really full cheeks and that's when I made the decision not to share the matzo balls at all and I was like yep that's everything and crumpled up the stuff and like walked over to where I couldn't be seen in the kitchen and then ate the matzo balls good for you with the dip <laughs> <laughs> I mean he did not need four mini pizzas in his face at once come on now like, <laughs> show some restraint he ate the first one and liked it so much that i guess the other three just flew in there he was worried that someone else was going to get him first so he just went possibly rah, 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 rah. Yeah. possibly i was like oh let's have this with lunch maybe he thought for lunch was what i said <laughs> i don't know that's okay <laughs> easy to make again i like that bacon trick i want to try that yeah, yeah. It's a great way of um, uh, reducing splatter because you can put the lid on yeah. and by the time the water evaporates and it starts sizzling, you still have the lid on. It still will get crispy if you keep going. Hmm. And then you don't have that splatter to clean up. Yeah. But I also then gave you the matzo that was just the plain stuff that oh, I had yes. made. What did you guys think about that? It was yeah. much softer, like not... Um... I don't know, the texture was... It wasn't rubbery. Like, sometimes matzo can be, yeah. like, squeaky on your teeth. Mm -hmm. I don't know how else to say that. Yeah. This was, like, oh. It was, I like, melt that. in your mouth. Yeah. Did you like the fact that it was salted? I When I get mozzarella mm -hmm. from the store, it's very bland. 
right? I like yeah. that these were salt, that you could add salt to this. I yeah. I actually thought matzo was supposed to be bland because it always right. is. But right. But clearly it does not need to be. It does not it was, need to be. That mm-hmm. was tasty. In her yeah. kit, she says that they will last for about seven days dry. But if you want to keep them going for a little longer, then put them in that solution of salt. Oh, I think that made it cool. even tastier. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the like texture that. and the taste of that was really good, Sarah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just not the look. <laughs> I think that's going to be the hard part about homemade cheese is making it look the way you expect it to look. It's not that right. it looks bad. It's just not what we're familiar with seeing right. cheese yeah. look like. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, I think it's just because we have been trained that cheese comes in a square blocked package. Right. Mm-hmm. Perfectly. How often yeah. do we ever get cheese that's not manufactured that's right. in a industrial facility with machines yeah. right that make machines, it, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. and they make it perfectly round or square or whatever mm. exactly so i would say the look really is less important because the flavor won out mm-hmm. totally by far on these cheeses. i agree yeah by far all right i did i did a couple things the first thing i wanted to do was i thought that because this cheese was so sharp and had such an intense flavor this mm-hmm. cheddar I wanted to cut it with something acidy. Mm-hmm. So I made a tomato vinaigrette from Samin's salt fat acid heat. It is onions, red wine vinegar, balsamic vinegar, tomatoes, basil, olive oil, garlic, salt. Mm. Basic, easy. Mm-hmm. So for the tomatoes, what makes it into like a tomato vinaigrette is you grate the tomatoes on a box grater and then discard the skins and so it like juices the tomato with the flesh to make this like really interesting liquid without over agitating like i'm sure you could skin and blanch and da 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 to get the tomato but this was a really easy way to just get all the juice Hmm. and flesh of the tomato into like sorry you grated the tomato did you have to freeze it cut it in half okay and then put it on your grater and seriously all the flesh grates away and you're left with the skin oh and then you just say goodbye to the skin or use it yeah it was really i'd never done that but it made this beautiful dressing Mm -mm -mm. and so i took that dressing and i just added it to uh some tomatoes cucumbers and chives that i chopped up like a salad kind of to just put with your cracker because i love Mm. when you see a picture of a cracker with a cheese and a little accoutrement on yeah. the Oh, very good. Yeah, very good. <laughs> and I will rest there. And we have teased her about her French before. And you've teased was... me about French before, so I'm just going to take my win. Uh... <laughs> Don't get used to it I, with exactly. the French. This is, this is the only time I'm going to win this, so we're just going to pretend like it's natural for me. <laughs> Uh, The other thing I chose to make, which I really was on the fence about the night before, I was like, oh, am I going to make a cracker? Because this Mm -hmm. sounds maybe stupid to take on right now. Making a cracker was so easy. It was like making a pie dough. You mix together your flour and the spices. You cut in butter or, as I like to do, grate butter Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that it incorporates in little tiny pieces. You add liquid. You bring it together. It's a pretty dry dough. You roll it out flat on a piece of parchment. You cut it with a pizza cutter, but you don't like need to move it around and you bake it in the oven for 10 minutes and wow. you have crackers. It was so snappy to do. Mm-hmm. So easy to do. I got that recipe online from melissaknorris.com. They separate from each other as they bake. Like so Ooh, cool. Funny. I have never made a cracker before. It was easy to do. And I thought they tasted like wheat thins. Or better. Right, better. Like they were mm-hmm. exactly that type of cracker. Mm-hmm. A little softer than a store bought. Pretty darn good. Like if you just toast them up again before you put your cheese with it. Oh, yeah. That'd be good. Really then they're nice. We and love crispy. those. And yeah. you guys know I have a kid who pretty much lives on oh. crackers. Fish crackers right. are his choice cracker. He will eat, it. like I am always buying crackers mm-hmm. because he will eat all. If there's no crackers in the house, where's the crackers? He was like, where are these crackers? What kind are these crackers? Where did they come from? And I said, Aaron made them. And he was like, no, Aaron made, you can make crackers. Now I fear he's going to expect me to make crackers. So you should do this with him. I think you could play with this recipe and have a ton of fun with it. And because 
he is totally capable in the kitchen he could make these by himself i'll bet you dollars to donuts mm. he could no. he could roll these out all you have to do is mix your dry ingredients grate in your butter bring it all together with your liquid roll it bake it done we'll have to give it a try i would say it took me maybe 30 minutes to pop these crackers out mm. So my husband started eating this, Erin, with absolutely no permission from me. <laughs> like, it was like, which was shocking because usually he's like, oh, is this what we get? Nope. Like it was just like, husband. they were oh. delicious. Mm-hmm. They were delicious. And I think um, I love the mozzarella. Mozzarella is my favorite. But this cheddar mm. was like out of this world, like something I've never tasted before. I would never have even called it cheddar. No, because it's not what I'm used to, uh, but it was so tasty, which is why my tummy wasn't very happy with me at the end of that, Oh, <laughs> a lot of, but I didn't care. I'll, I'll <laughs> still do it again. <laughs> like we have 30 more cheese making opportunities yes. ahead of us with yes. the ingredients that are included in this kit from Alexis at Cheesemaker. Can you make me more cheddar? I am going to be making, I see that there's this aging thing. I don't know if I have the self-control to (laughs) age this cheese as it recommends, but I'm going to try and do one of, like, once I make a cheddar that I'm like, oh, I think this is better cheddar than the last, (laughs) (laughs) then I'm going to try and do the, um, it's got wax to melt that you paint on. Oh. Oh, Oh, yeah. And then you age it. Oh, interesting. You can age it for a minimum of three months up to a year. (gasps) What? And does that sit in your pantry or in your fridge? In a cool, dark place. Oh, in your cellar. I mean, I have a little Mm. storage room under the stairs that's pretty cool and dark and dry. Oh, that'd be great to try. Maybe I will try this. And with our kits, we can also make, so with the one that Sarah's got, we can make ricotta. That's Mm -hmm. right. And the one that I have, you can also make like cow's milk feta. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have options to make all kinds of cheese. Mm -hmm. And we want to remind our listeners that there is the opportunity for you to enter if you are in Canada. Excluding Quebec. Quebec. Yeah, sorry. (laughs) Sorry, Quebec. They say say you're not allowed. But if you're in Canada... (laughs) And you are interested in making, Alexis gave us a free vegan cheese kit. Which it promises to be good with the reviews. Which maybe nobody should enter the contest and we will make the vegan cheese and then just tell you how good it is. Because that's how, that's how I'd like to see this go. No, uh, no, we'd, we'd like, like to send you guys to have the opportunity yeah. to make uh, vegan cheese at home from... It comes with cashews. Excellent. Yeah. In case so, that's important for anyone to know. And it's really uh, easy, as she said, right? Yeah, like it's she said this one was one. foolproof, you don't really cook easy. it or anything. You just no. blend it up. Yeah. So if you'd like to, head over to our Instagram page, Three Kitchens Podcast. I think what we'll have you do is just tag someone who you think would enjoy listening to the podcast, uh, who's not already following us. And that's it. That'll, that'll put you in the draw. Make yeah. sure you head over to Cheesemaker. And follow them and see what they're up to because they'll have tips and ideas. And there's also on the website, there's videos and things to learn about. And And if you don't win a kit or you want to go out and make this cheese, make a cheese, if you want to like experiment with this process, this is the way to do it. Mm -hmm. She has made it super accessible. Who thought you could make cheese like this in your kitchen? Like Mm -hmm. mind blown. (laughs) Yeah, I love this. If anybody makes these kits, let us know. Come yeah. back and tell us or send us an email at three kitchenspodcast at gmail.com. Tell us your experience yeah. making the cheese because we want to we wanna hear about it. It's so fun. And now for the fine print. Remember, when you like, subscribe, review, or share this podcast, it helps more people find us. Thank you so much for listening. This is the best cheese I've ever had. It's more of a fancy cracker cheese.